Hey all, welcome back to Bulls with the Bard. My name is Cakes, I am your host. Today we are continuing our conversation about problem plays with a discussion about Othello. Othello is technically not a problem play, but I do think it slots very well into the second kind of less popular definition of problem play, which is that it presents some subject matter that is problematic for the time period in which we are producing now. Um, I am very excited to talk about this play. It is deeply problematic, but it is definitely also one of my favorites in the canon. And to have this conversation, I have two new friends to the podcast that I'm very excited to welcome. First, we have Navi. Navi, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. And hi, and thank you, Cakes. Um, Navi here. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a musician. I do a lot of things. Uh, some of them are exciting. Some of them are super boring. Uh, and I am excited to be on here today to talk about the classic Julia Stiles movie, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that they made into a play. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, Navi. And our second guest for the day is Shaq. Shaq, bow, would you like bow, to bow, bow, bow. <laughs> <laughs> Mic check, one, two, one, two, turn my headphones. It's like, nah, it's like, nah. Yeah. Um, I introduce myself. Uh, my name is Shaq. Um, I, you know, I rap name, rap name is Shaquille Jamal, but uh, I'm a local actor in the DMV area. Um, love Shakespeare. Um, I feel like talking about this show without mentioning Omar Epps would have been a mistake. So Navi, I thank you for bringing up. Oh, um, <laughs> um, but Shaq, yeah. I so, hate to do this so early in what will be a very complex discussion, but I'm pretty sure it was Mackay Pfeiffer. <laughs> oh, shit. Ooh, shit. <laughs> hey, look, they, they are like the similar caliber of actor. And I'm okay yeah, being oh. wrong. I'm no, going to say I, that. I'm, yeah. I'm okay being wrong. But uh, it's like the time period where they were all doing things together. Um, and yeah, anyways, uh, not it's weird because I point. picture the movie Juice. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Kids. Oh, did My you? Is, uh, yeah. So Juice and O like uh, uh, OJ. Juice is Omar Epps. Yeah. yeah so I'm like, yeah. oh, damn. OK, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're good. You're what a good. Tangent. <laughs> welcome nice, y'all no this is a great introduction to both of you i love it <laughs> um so before we dive into the conversation we're gonna get a little high i think for the first time this season everybody here is gonna get high with me which is super exciting <laughs> All right, y'all, we are back. Navi and I smoked in the Zoom room while Shaq went outside and enjoyed his bowl. We are ready to talk about Othello. My first question about this play is that, like, there's, there's a lot of racism in this play. Some of it is super overt. Some of it is more subtle. How do we approach a play that is problematic in that way? Like, do we lean into it? Do we try to cut what we don't need? Like, what do we think about that? Um, do either of you have a preference on who wants to start with that question? I don't think I feel like when you cut. talk, Oop, go ahead. <laughs> we did worst case scenario. Go for it, Jack. <laughs> I was just going to say, I feel like when you cut, it has to have a purpose. Not saying that you shouldn't cut, but like, I don't know, like certain cuts can kind of get you to the point quicker while other cuts are kind of like you miss out on like the extra, you know, the real chunky like details. Hmm. I'm I'm always a fan of taking things in context and the context of time and where it was. And I think Othello and all these plays have come into the modern context and are still carrying a lot of weight from the old days. But it helps us to understand the 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 fullness of that time period as best as we can and even in how it was how art was made in that time period so i i would almost rather have like footnotes or which you can't really do in a live context but have like footnotes or addendums or things that specify around and provide context to those moments than cut them hmm. but in a live context i can see how 
There's some shit you just don't want to do on stage. Although I don't think there's any of that in Othello. Shaq, you played Othello. Is there stuff know. you would cut? I mean, like, I feel like if you cut, well, we had a really cut version, you know what I mean? Compared mm -hmm. to like what's what I read in like college. Um, and ours was cut. Well, because we also had to do like 90 minute versions of it, which is like, that's a lot to condense in 90 minutes. It's like, oh, oh, snap. He's scary. They're arresting him. He's about to kill that white woman. So it's it's like weird because you're also doing it for high schools. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what we were doing for national players. And I thought I thought that it was good that some of the more violent stuff was cut. Um, some of the more racist stuff was cut, like because you're doing it for kids. Um, but at the same time, like when you're doing it full out, it's like you got to do it full out. It's it, I don't know. It, it, it's like it, the show is literally about like domestic abuse suicide it's like all the like things at once yeah there's a lot of toxicity happening that just thriving throughout this show yeah i read it for the first time in years like a few weeks ago and i think the thing that like stood out most to me was like i had i had been in the play before and a lot of the like more overt racism that comes from characters like Rabanchio and Iago like had always stuck out to me but in this read I was like oh holy shit like even the people who respect this guy are like saying things like oh don't worry Brabantio your son-in-law is far more fair than black like it's yes, casual it's like, yeah, yeah super casual which like uh, as I was reading it I was like huh like, does Shakespeare write this because Shakespeare is racist himself? Or does Shakespeare write this because Shakespeare 400 years ago was in, in tune with, like, things like microaggressions somehow? Like, I thought that was so interesting to me. I kind of think it's both of those things. Yeah. I, I feel like, yeah. like, past a certain point, which we're still living in an age of, like, where people are racist. You know what I mean? Anyway. But I also feel like, in that time, and I'm not excusing casual racism, you know what I mean? But in that time, you were just racist. Like, yeah. all the shows are like that. It's very, like, casually, like, oh, it's not, I'm not doing anything bad, you know what I mean? And I don't think that's cool, and I think people don't see it for that, which is why it's, like, plays like Othello now are super problematic, because people are, like, actually absorbing the themes. But then it's also, like, <laughs> it's a classic, you know what I'm saying? But Yeah. yeah. I guess kind of jumping off from all of those problematic points we can dive into the character of Othello himself um how do y'all think we can present this character with nuance because I I feel like there's a danger to presenting him like all one way like all the violent way um and I feel like there's textual support for him being actually kind of lovely at the beginning but i don't know like does it work to show him as a victim of cyclical violence as much of as a purveyor of it does do, like should we like him at the beginning of the play or like what what are your thoughts on how we approach this character I shack do you want to go first or navi you looked like you had something to say I mean, I have some, I have thoughts. I don't know if I have anything super cohesive, but I'll go for it. Yeah, I I think that when I revisited Othello recently, what struck me was that like a lot of the, the racism is ingrained one in there. It's like all there. And I had a different context. I'm much older now than when I read it in high school um, of like, the more and the nature of the more in that time period where it would literally it was the equivalent of the word foreigner in that mm -hmm. context you talk about othello is fighting the turks that it's it there's this added layer that he is fighting other moors on behalf of these people um yeah because he's like a slave to them he's a slave mm -hmm. to them since he was a boy yeah, he's a slave. Now he's a general. Like there is this weird layer there that I only really picked up now that that it just makes him more of a tragic character to me. I also think that like there is inherent like 
male toxicity and what like what Iago taps at and and plays upon the social engineering that he does, which is still super relevant today. Social engineering is a massive part of how this world goes where it goes. Um, it taps into a lot of inherent stuff that I think is still relevant to to attack and to look at because humans just don't learn sometimes. It, what struck with me is like, I understand why it is still relevant now because there's still a lot of these things present in how average everyday people live their lives. Yeah, I I vibe with that. I was watching an RSC production of the play this week and they did something that I'd never seen done with the play before, which was that like before several of the scenes that Othello was in when the war was still going on and then like a little bit after the war was going on, they would have these lead-ins to scenes where Othello would be like, orchestrating torture sessions for the Turks and it was like oh okay systemically there is literally this violence already ingrained in this character and like mm -hmm. maybe they would never before all of this they would never have like taken that beyond this room that they do this in but it's there and Iago mm -hmm. Iago does know to to tap at that which is interesting yeah. there's a there's a quality like othello is a warrior he's a soldier um and i say this and you know i mean it i mean it quite sincerely as a good quality of othello he's a bit of a himbo in that he does he's a little <laughs> oblivious to a lot of what's going on around him and like he's just getting twisted and pulled by iago and like you understand that because you you want to root for him i i i come from a point of view where whenever i go to read something or see something i don't try to like or identify with any of the characters i try to view it as impartial or as outside as to me as possible rather than like putting myself in shoes of things and i you know i still think that he's a tragic character but there's there's a lot of complexness in the intersectionality beyond just race, where Othello's layers make for fascinating performance and and continued reflection, I guess is what I wanted to say like 13 sentences ago. <laughs> Weed podcasts. Weed podcasts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> make it a little harder to be coherent about Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. Nah, but that's real though. That's so real because... You know, I feel like having that slave mindset throughout the play suggests that Shakespeare understands racism on a level where it's like, you know, that this shit is negative because of the way the play escalates because of how Iago is like. And I feel like no character as an actor, we're actors, you know what I'm saying? We're not going to like think we're villains. We don't think that we're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. But like with textually, he is like, -ha, like, you know what I'm saying? Some of the shit that he says. So it's like when he's so clearly the villain and then like especially audiences for however the fuck long ago you know are able to listen to this and be like well i don't know if we're reflecting because look how violent and crazy i've never heard of this thing about the torture never heard that that's that's wild to me and like you know you say navi that like it's like important that like people can like delve into these multifaceted and it's a multifaceted character like i'm not gonna lie um but it's it's i don't know i feel like that was the first time I did a show and I was like, oh, I have to like not use my personal experience or like connect myself to this character. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, it's it, and this is a tangent. I'm so sorry, but You're I related fine. to kind of how like when the Black Lives Matter like stuff first like happened, you just see all these productions of like race and in the sun and, you know, fences and which is, I mean, dope because it's like black work. Let's get it. But these characters like the main characters in these shows are like these abusive alcoholic like negative figures that like represent this so it's like it's the same it's the same sauce to me so like if i were to see othello for the first time when it was first written i would be like oh that's interesting that you tackled race in such a way where you like know what it is but then like after that i'd be like all right shut that shit down like right now i don't know if i would i would play the character again because it's like multifaceted but i don't know if i would go see it again like i don't need to see huh. it again interesting mm -hmm. you know, he 
He fucking kills somebody on stage. Like, well, yeah. I like people getting killed on stage. Don't get me wrong. Like, I like, <laughs> like, I like fucking like, you know, like stage combat type shit. But like, <laughs> I don't need to see like abuse over and over and over again. And if that's supposed to be like a representation of like what black men see, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that to me, is like, we don't need it. We don't mm. need it. Mm. Not to just disagree, but. No, no, totally. no, that's it's like in both ways. Yeah. yeah, that that perspective is exactly why I wanted to have this conversation in the first place. And also exactly why I wanted to have multiple guests per conversation this season, because I want people to disagree. <laughs> may I add, may I add that Othello also is like 40. When I played the character, I was like 25. So like what made it more like for me, like it made it more new. You know what I'm saying? Like this whole your general now. It was like I kind of played it that way because I was like, I don't know how to play. Not to say I don't know how to play general. I was a general, but it's like I feel like even being a slave to become the general. It's like you're so great, you're so stoic, or like you know, my director was like, it's he's a fighter. He's like like you said, now he's a warrior. Shaq, I I hope you don't think I disagreed with you. I agree. Oh no, uh, yeah. I I think we should preserve the idea. I don't think it needs to be performed. We got digital media. Mm. Just record that shit and put it away. Um, I'm f I'm of the mindset that the best thing we could do with Shakespeare is is salvage it for the parts that are relevant to now and keep moving on with our lives rather than get caught up in like the cult of preserving it as like the go-to thing that like, cause, cause then it just falls into the capitalist canon of, Oh, we need to, we need to solve racism real quick. Like put it on, put on Othello, put on this, put on that, it, make it tragic, make it sad. And I don't love that about anything in, in the arts world when it reaches that point where if, if it hits that point, then yeah, maybe we should put a moratorium on it until people know how to behave. We have Othello at home. I, I feel like uh, go Shaq. I was going to say fine? like, I first, like, I don't want to say fell in love with the play. That's corny as a motherfucker. But, like, I mean, like, <laughs> I first was like, oh, shit, the writing in this is dope because I I had used it for, like, a project in school when I was, like, a sophomore in college. I had used the um, Be Not Afraid That You Do See Me Weapon job. Like, and I was like, I had to analyze it. You had to scan it. And I was like, when I, when I had, like, analyzed the beauty of what it meant to kill yourself because you did something wrong, that sounds depressing as fuck. But, like, it's the catharsis in these characters when they understand what they did was fucked up. Mm. I, I think, you know, Hamlet, like Coriolanus, all that shit. Like you just feel the catharsis mm -hmm. and the reflecting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know I, how I got on that tangent. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. But especially at the end of this play, I think when it hits Othello, it might be like the hardest catharsis moment to watch in the entire canon. Yeah. like oh shit what did i do Transitioning. here's a thought oh go 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 here's a thought what if we took othello and we put it behind like nine increasingly difficult anime challenges and if someone wanted to produce othello they had to go through like a trial in order to get to the script uh, if we take it out of the public domain, put it in the hands of <laughs> anime trials <laughs> so that no random, like, you know, primarily white theater institution out in the middle of nowhere wants to put on a version of Othello that is super insensitive and there's no one there like going, hey, do you realize that this looks X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, X, W, Y, Z. <laughs> wow, I really fucked the landing up there. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, perhaps it's the kind of thing that, like, it shouldn't just be free range for anyone to do. Especially in America. I feel like Othello is a play from Europe, but it hits differently in America. Because it is also about a black man and a white woman and death and deception and sexual frustration and that is like a very american fucking issue yeah and that that transitions us kind of per perfectly into one of the questions i had for today which is like that that is a very american perception of what this play is about um 
I know, uh, Navi, you like sent us information about Sri Lankan Moors, and I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that at some point during this as well. Um, but yeah, I guess like one of my questions is, is there value to presenting this play with other BIPOC people playing the role of Othello, keeping in mind that the word Moor does not technically mean black man or is it so imprinted on american culture at this point that you can't separate those two things yeah so the question i would pose is who decided that othello was top tier canon mm -hmm. for representing black culture mm -hmm. in shakespeare was it white people or black people yeah, very, very um, likely white definitely people. Definitely white folks. Yeah. White yeah. folks for show. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <For sure. laughs> no, no question. <laughs> I you know, no in question. the in, I'm sure in the realm of like stories, there's a ton of new stories that can be told that have the nuance and complexity. And I wonder if it is more useful at disambiguating. Like, I'm not sure I'm saying this. I don't know if I necessarily stand firm on it as, as a thing I believe in, but if it's worth disambiguating it for the sake of representing other cultures that have similar issues in how they are viewed versus like having it be maintained as a true, like black it's not, I, I, it's like, an, it's not an empowerment story. It's not a, a feel good story about what it feels like to be a black man. So I think a dark skinned person should play the role. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah, do not think was, that this is a role too. that can be played by a light skinned person. Um, Moors in the, in the, in the heyday are a term that were used for North Africans, for people from the Middle East, for people from India. It was literally the go-to in Europe for anyone who was brown was a Moor. Moorish. Um, Moorish, yeah. And I think there's some value in displaying that. You know, what do you say? You're saying that that time period was very culturally diverse. Because I don't know. Like, does it say where Othello's from? We can Google that. Yeah, yeah I don't it. I don't know if it ever does. Siri. Hey Siri, where is Othello That's from? Good. Now the cops are in it, fucking AI. <laughs> God damn it. Chad GPT. <laughs> Either way, I think there are more interesting stories and more complex and nuanced stories that should be adapted by the larger BIPOC canon. And perhaps if it if there are better stories to be told than Othello that we sort of disambiguate out into the broader public, I'm for that. I don't know. Shaq, what do you think? First thing I'll say is Shakespeare Theater Company did it. And I wanted to Google both because when they did Othello, it wasn't like a traditionally black dude. Mm -hmm. I, I can't. Yeah, I, I'm I want to find his name so I don't sound like an ignorant piece of person. I know. I think I know it, but I don't want to. I didn't get a chance to see incorrect. it. Correct. It was a it was a very good production of Othello. When was this? Well, oh gosh, this years was... ago, like six or seven years ago. Yeah, I about six or seven. He's like the villain, the big bad in the first Iron Man movie. Yeah, his name is Far Faran Tahir. And like, even in his name, like that. Yeah, you're right. Wow. He has, ooh, snap. Yeah, he's got credits he's on Star credits. Too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> credits on credits on credits. Let's go, Faran. Shout out, Faran. Brr, 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 brr. Like, <laughs> but yeah, the yeah. Pod. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, Faran, get on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's dope. Um, but yeah, like I would say if I ever went to go see the show, and I know I said that I wouldn't want to go see the show, but if I went to go see the show and Othello was played by like somebody like of Hispanic descent or somebody who was like not dark skinned, I would be like, not to say that the person couldn't play the role as effectively, like as they process the beats, but like I would be like, I don't know what this is trying to say. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because you have to think that the casting of that would be because either nobody else fucking showed up <laughs> or like, I, I think it'd just be weird. If, I don't know the if the colorism like is so ingrained in the language. It's so ingrained in like, they're talking yeah. about how he's dark of skin. They're talking yeah. about like comparing and, him to the animals and like all that. Like yeah, it's, like, it is so fundamentally a part of the show. It sounds fucked up. So then we have to be like, oh, Othello should be black. 
But it's like, and when you think of it like that, it's like nobody should be doing this play. <laughs> I mean, when God, did they man. stop doing blackface versions of Othello? The 70s? God. Like not yeah. that long ago? Gosh. And it just speaks to so much like minstrel work that people do because when you think about the the Negro performer themselves putting on the blackface with the cork and stuff like that, it's just like, this. we know that this is not how we are. Like being Othello, we know that Unfortunately, this violence is something that's been, I guess, been in prejudice against us for generations. But like Othello himself, we know that that's not how black people operate, even though it sometimes happens. That, that could be a white guy. And in the sense of disambiguating it, I'm like, oh, it could be a white guy. It could be this, you know. I heard about like a production where they flipped it, where Othello was white and Iago was black. I'm sure that's I mentioned happened. that I heard... in the chat. They, there was oh, a my. Party Down episode which it's a satire show where they yeah, had this sure. character who keeps like accidentally getting fans on the alt right like he doesn't he he does not realize he's doing it but everything he does he just cluelessly gets more alt right fans like he has a song called my struggle <laughs> that's just this beach blonde uh -huh. white guy talking about his pains and then he's like he performs in a version of othello that was race swapped <laughs> oh no gosh <laughs> I think Gosh, STC... I, I would not tell anybody that I was a part of that. <laughs> I think STC also did a production where Patrick Stewart was Othello and everybody else was non-white. Yeah, that was a choice. That was like oh no, the, the over a decade ago. That not yeah. my Picard. Ag <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Professor Xavier, no. Uh, ooh, that's disheartening. So uh, yeah, and then I guess. I wonder then, like, at what point is the story have the ability to do just as much harm as good mm -hmm. in who has the ability to present it and what their motives are in presenting it, right? Mm -hmm. Because now that you've said that, Shaq, I could totally see the version of Othello that is bent and twisted into a minstrel show. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, where Othello is like a comic character, who is yeah. getting twisted and manipulated. And I hate that. I hate the idea that that is something mm -hmm. that could have happened at some point in time. Um, I mean, it really just depends on how bold people are for real. I mean, mm -hmm. to, to be devil's advocate, like the one thing I think that is a benefit of, of putting on this production is that like, expect, and I hate to say this, but especially in like the Midwestern areas, if you have the right cast, to get the feeling of tragedy, more, I think it teaches things on a base level, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like, it's like, if you're, if not say if you're like a racist Donald Trump voting ass person, like in fucking Wisconsin, and you go see Othello, and you're like, oh, poor Negro, like, you know, I don't think it's like that. But I, I do think it, it makes you aware of something, because that's what it was when we did it, because we were on tour, and we were in like, bumfuck, you know what I'm saying? So now I want to talk about that. Yeah. I want to yeah. know, know all about being in middle America performing. At all that right. Time. Hold on. So before we, all right. So, all right. I got a couple things to say before I like, <laughs> no pressure. Things. Like I, in general, like I'm just curious, like what are some like mildly surprising moments that you had and surprising mm -hmm. in either a positive or a negative way. And all right. with, with the people and the places you went to, not necessarily the production. Yeah. So sorry. I, I like I think about this like often. Like when when it comes to like why I still act and do this shit was um we were in Kentucky. I think uh I don't remember what city. It could have been Paducah. I'm not sure. Wherever the sky pack is. Any who's on. So like we were rehearsing the show and like we we were rehearsing on the stage of this like community center that only had rented which was awesome because we just had a stage all to ourselves. And like, there was this little black kid who had walked in um, and cause he was like messing with the pinball machine. But then he started watching us uh, do it. And I was like newly doing the character. Like I hadn't performed it yet. So I'm still in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And like the mom comes up to me afterwards and she was talking about how, like, this is before COVID, just, but she was talking about how her son was recently sick. And I was like, oh, no, that sucks. And she's like, he hasn't been able to go out and see things. So I take him to, like, the community center so he can play pinball, be social with the other kids. Um, and he watched us do Othello. And, like, she was like, it was so dope for him to see, like, a black person 
up on stage like because he's a he's a commanding character he's a general you know what i'm saying like like you said he does have qualities to be admired as much as we talk about like you know he's as he's portrayed to be this violent monster kind of thing but he you know to see it's like it's like a kid seeing obama almost not to compare those two mm -hmm. but it's like you it's like you see somebody on that level not to say he, he thought i was obama <laughs> like nah <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so he thought i was obama like, <laughs> that's what it was like in the midwest <laughs> no 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 but actually when but it was it was dope to be in like other black kids like came up to me and would say that over the course of the tour that it was like dope because there's not people like doing that where they're at and I thought that that was really cool and special. And on the one hand, I was like, man, we need this shit. But on the other hand, I was like, oh, it's you're in the Midwest doing Othello. So for as many people that you touch, how many people do you skate over? You know what I'm saying? So it, it's it's a really large conversation, not just about like my experience, but like ally shit. You know what I'm saying? And like why you why we do this show where we do it. We didn't do it like in like Stuttgart, Arkansas. Hell no, nah, we weren't like dumb. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but <laughs> it was just, and I think that's kind of why people do the show. Cause it's like theater is to be experienced, not necessarily to be judged. I feel like the moment that we judge it, we're a different type of patron. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah, especially like when you're working on the show. Like, no, I mean, I feel like if you were like sound designing Othello, it'd be like, yeah, I'm sound designing it. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? But it's, you know, I don't know if I would turn it down. Have either of you ever heard of Daryl Davis? No, nah, who's have that? Not. Does that name ring a bell? Mm -mm. Um, Shaq, what you're talking about with Othello and traveling and going to these places, Daryl Davis is, you. he goes viral every couple of months and couple of times a year so you know he is the uh black blues rock and roll musician who has converted like 400 kkk members wow um, oh who has yeah yeah like, give up the thing so I so you're talking about daryl yeah. davis is based out of frederick maryland wow um, and he is so all of his stuff about like befriending kkk members and eventually convincing them to take off their robes a lot of it is maryland where frederick has one of the highest and and has had one of the highest Ku Klux Klan uh, memberships for decades, not centuries. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. Uh -huh. But wow. his whole thing is the only way you can change is by providing like a glimmer of empathy for someone to latch on to finding something. And so for him, it's I it's like having a beer with these people and inviting them to come see his band play and or just like having a having a dinner with them and talking to them. And he like goes out of his way to like deprogram KKK members. And he's been doing it for uh, decades. When I first heard about that guy, I was like, that seems like a very dangerous occupation. You know what I'm saying? Cause like the, I heard a story where it was like, he didn't, he didn't have like a team of dudes going and it was just him. And I think it was his neighbor who he converted first. And it's just like a, I don't know. It's, it's like when you're watching get out and you're like, Man, you know you're not supposed to be going to that house. You know you's not, you know what I'm saying? It's just like uh nah. I bring that up because something I always think about like in my path to try and make confrontative theater that and art and music and things that change people's minds, I'm always trying to be like what is the best way to get to the audience that needs to hear it? And I feel like I that's why I'm so curious about something like Othello in the Midwest where like there are people to who need to start seeing a glimmer of empathy in a black male on stage for them to start thinking about things they've never needed to think about because they got all white town, exactly. all white family, everyone they work with is white, their whole school is white. Um, they've seen people of color on TV and stuff, but that's that comes through a filter depending on who they are and where they live. Um and you get a chance to go out there and and provide a face to face, not like a something on a phone screen, like a face to face opportunity to to show some empathy. I think there's a lot of value to that. Mm -hmm. Now, is that play Othello? <laughs> um, is something I'm still not a hundred percent sure on. Versus, like, is there some is there some better way to do that without a character who also like kills a white woman, mm -hmm. um, and then kills himself when he realizes what he what he's done? Yeah, um, 
That's so interesting. Shaq, I was excited to have you on the podcast because a few months ago, the Utah Shakespeare Festival, which is where I grew up, announced that they were doing like their educational tour was Othello. And nice. my gut reaction to that was like, oh, <laughs> uh there are ways that that could go and at the time i just like my reaction was like i'm just gonna make a tiktok video and be like hey like let's pass along the knowledge like anything that i'm saying right now is stuff that i've i've heard from other people just about like considering what maybe a rehearsal room should look like who should be in that rehearsal room like how are we looking out for our actors in situations where like they might be doing a talk back and a student might ask a racist question like how do you how are we thinking about these things when we're deciding to put a fellow in schools in southern utah in the middle of nowhere um so i was i was very excited to have you on the show because you've somewhat had the experience of being in those shoes um but I feel like with a, a company that may be slightly more aware or have more experience with BIPOC people to think about those things. Um, That's true. Only only Maryland is different than like, you know, Utah. Like Yes. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I feel like every show needs like an intimacy choreographer if you have a certain level of like, hmm. you know what I'm saying? And the reason why I said nice, even though it's like, it's like difficult. It's a show that I don't think it needs to be put on right now, but if you do it, it's because it's difficult. You know what I'm saying? That's the type of show where you need all hands on deck, where you need intimacy choreography. You need explicit choreography. You know what I'm saying? People talking to you about, are you okay? Like doing that type of shit. Like for me personally, like bro, like what is it like to, even if you're doing stage combat, to just choke a white woman on stage? And then, like, be like, well, this is exactly what people think I'm supposed to do. This is what Shakespeare thinks I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I feel like the actors need the support. And there needs to be, like Navi said, a reason for why you're doing it. And, like, if the reason is because it's like you put in butts in seats or that's what's going to sell tickets to your tour, uh, I'm not going to say that's a bad idea, but I'm going to say that it would be misguided if you didn't have, like, some type of purpose. You know what I'm saying? If I can say that, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not but you that. bring up a you bring up a good point, Shaq, and I think that's something that like I have found a lot of times when I'm the only person of color in creative spaces that it's not necessarily that people are like actively malicious. In, they are just they don't ask the questions because they don't know that the questions need to be asked. Right? Like, how do you know uh, you're wrong if you don't even know? Right. The, the, yeah. I have found, and that's a lot of labor, right? To be the one person in the room to be like, hey, do you realize that this looks like blackface right now? Or, hey, do you understand the significance of having this one black character be confronted by five white women right now? And like, oh, I didn't even think about it. And I'm not specifically talking about Othello, but there are shows that I've worked on where like, it doesn't even cross people's minds to mm -hmm. think about it. I think with something like Othello, starting from the top down, affinity spaces, BIPOC people only in the like running of it. Like I like I think that if you're directing it, if you're adapting it, if you're like in that top administration team, I don't think that white people need to be there for that because they won't ask the right question. Mm -hmm. um, that's just me though. I I have found that like in something like this, there are ways that it can be done tactfully, tastefully, interestingly, and aggressively, which is something that I think it needs to be because like Shaq said, it's it's a hard play. There, like it hits at a very primal level, and that is valuable in order for whatever message you're sending to get across. But if the right people aren't steering the ship and checking the maps and looking at the stars and doing all the other things that it's required to steer the boat and they're just doing it for money or name recognition or stuff like that. Like, why are you doing it? Yeah. Uh, having grown up in Utah and having like moved to DC and learned a lot, a lot of that resonates with me in that my experience was like, I didn't know to ask the question a, and then B, I think for a long time, 
I excused that by being like, well, I didn't really have any BIPOC people around me to like teach me those things. So that's, that's what that was. And then I kind of had another period of like, that's a lie, Michaela. You actually did have like one mixed race black friend. You did have one Filipino friend, but they were always the one person in that space. And so if they did have those experiences of feeling uncomfortable or feeling like they weren't safe in a space, I don't think there was ever a time that they felt comfortable enough to speak out about those mm -hmm. things or to say something about those things. So yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. If if a play like this is going to be approached, you, you can't have that going on or you're not going to approach it responsibly. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm of two different minds, right? Because it's like, it's like, we're like, why should we do Othello right now? But then it's like, because it's hard and it's difficult and the shit that people don't need to see, but they need to see. It's like, why are you doing it? And my question is like, is the director black? You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. like, I don't know. Like like you said, steering the ship is so important, Navi. Like, I don't And also providing the spaces to care for that through mm -hmm. the lens of race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um on all fronts, like uh, just top down in how you're producing it. Because the questions will get, you know, down to what happens if an audience member comes up and says something. Well, if everyone on the team is like understands why they are doing this and understands the value it has, uh, don't quote me on this one, but I think that like that actor or whoever is on in the chair getting asked the question has never been better prepared to be mm -hmm. able to like say do say and do the thing that not only like shows that they are the better person but inspires other people in that room who are who who need to see that kind of bully get put down in their neck of the woods and have not over some like petty racist shit you know i also say that when we did the show i didn't really have any like explicitly i had i had racist experiences but never derived from the show and that's why i was like the thing about the tragedy and the beauty of some of the things that are going on it's because like like you said earlier you know it's a multifaceted character if somebody does it well it's not that hard because the text is dope you know so it's like if you're emoting, if you're showing that emotion, then in a way, people get what they came for. Mm. There's lots of shows that I don't think that I would want to see twice. There's a term used for modern stuff, although you could you could apply it to old stuff called you know, trauma porn. And uh -huh. Othello is a very trauma porn show in a lot of ways uh, yeah, where like true. it wants you to feel misery. It wants you to like live in it and the character that you're following dies only bad stuff happens no one is happy um and a question of like how effective is that in general as a tool in 2023 mm -hmm. like i think that like the pandemic not to bring up the pandemic like every mm -hmm. other podcast on the internet i have noticed that we are moving away as a society from really enjoying trauma porn unless it's in extreme contexts like a like house of the dragon or something where it's like in a fantasy world where you can mm -hmm. dissociate mm -hmm. it from reality and focus more on like what is cheerful and colorful and happy because they've had so much time to like wallow in stuff especially in the middle of you know having time to sit at home and wallow in stuff while one of the largest civil rights movements was happening i think really hit a lot of people especially americans in a weird way where i wonder if is othello like is it too sad for its own good question mark i don't know huh? maybe that's not something i i'm actually curious about now i tell y'all that i was on a weed podcast <laughs> what <laughs> uh, no it's interesting like one of the things that has come up as we've been talking for me is like uh just how many white people do this play because they just love Iago and they want to watch Iago. Like that's the least sad, my least sad part of this play is like, it's kind of satisfying to watch him weave his little web, I guess. But like, if you're listening in 2023, the real life modern day equivalent of Iago is some Russian sitting in a giant dank warehouse with hundreds of other people typing controlling hundreds of bots 
that are swarming yeah. memes on websites all over the internet. Oh my yeah. god, let's that is your that. modern day. That's Iago. a horror story right there, for real. Oh my yeah. god, controlling that shit. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, you hate that guy. Yeah, he's such a good villain. That's what it, what hurts about it. Like, I love a good villain. So I watched the the Ian McKellen Iago mm-hmm. to to mm-hmm. before this, and like, oh, he's so good as Iago. yeah. <laughs> it's rough. Um, yeah, I don't like I don't like that. That's the kind of character is, but it's also a character I like i feel is as relevant today as it has ever been Hmm. Mm. this like scheming manipulator who who sits back and like lets ripples ruin things truly i i was talking with my parents yesterday about like everything that's going on in the country right now and and the state of things and how a lot of the times they will frequently like to like write off the republicans as stupid and i'm like no (laughs) They're scheming and they're smart and they're taking our rights away. They're playing You're... a 50 year game. Mm-hmm. It's it may feel inconspicuous to you, just like Iago does, but they are they're better at being villains than you realize they are. You know who Iago is? Steve Bannon. Mm-hmm. That's that's Iago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sitting sitting behind the scenes pulling threads. Mm-hmm. Wait, can I? So I think that doing I like I keep thinking about this and I'm like, I think doing it in Utah is important. I, I keep flip flopping. I keep flip flopping <laughs> because it because it's like, man, these white people need to learn how fucked up y'all make us. But at the same time, like the production, like again, needs to say that. But I also think about like, that's Utah. This is Utah Shakespeare, little educational tour. I, not to be hating on the actors, I'm sure it's going to be a whatever kind of production, but it's like it's not like it's on Broadway, you know what I mean? But like, if we think a little bit bigger, if we take this play bigger and like, are we going to do this on quote unquote the great white way? Like, you know what I'm saying? Are we going to do a Dello for on that type of scale? And then you see black kids getting shot in school, getting shot by the cops, that would be a mistake. When I actually think about it, like on an actual, because like. Navi, when you were talking about just like topically about what's going on in the world, you know, even post pandemic about seeing things that are negative, you want to see positive things. It's like, bro, like topically what's going on in America right now, this play would not help anything because all it's saying is like a black person. It's showing the the fucked up generational cycle of a black person doing it to themselves. Yep. And the fact that a white person is the one who wrote the show is the most disturbing part about the play. So it's like, I don't think 2023 big case at Thello, it has to be educational. I mean, honestly, though, when you look at theater websites, like outside of a certain area, I would even say theater websites in general, their staff is usually it's mostly rough. white folks. It's rough. It's mostly white folks. Yeah. It's we're, we we stand the Oregon Shakespeare Festival at Bulls with the Bard because they're yeah. doing the kinds of Shakespeare that that we want to see. I feel like I, okay, I'm flip flopping again. I think <laughs> Othello, <laughs> Othello doesn't need to be done anywhere unless it's like a small place. But like if Willie did Othello, I can't not go see it. And I know I said I wouldn't want to go see it because it's oh God, it's it's torture porn. Everybody loves torture porn, yeah. unfortunately. We haven't evolved beyond, as a society, beyond the need for torture porn as a way to vent our frustrations. <laughs> you know what's going to fuck you up is the fact that, like, what do little babies laugh at the most? It's people getting hurt or bopped by things, mm-hmm. which means that I think, this is my opinion, but, like, on, like, when we are born and we start to see, like, these, like, primal things that make us laugh, we're created very early. So it's like these themes were they're built in us. Violence is built into us. Mm-hmm. And I think I guess connecting this back to the play, it's like it needs to be done because violence is the problem. Mm-hmm. And I always think that the the best type of theater addresses the problem. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. when is torture porn too much? I guess is the question. Mm. Yeah. Have they ever done a gender swap, Othello? Uh, I have not seen gender swapped. Uh, Taffety Punk did all female mm, a few years ago. Yeah. Which was really interesting. Yeah. Cause, cause that's where I see there's still being room 
to that evolve would be cool. the framework yeah. because yeah. so much of Othello in how we know it and how we have known it is about toxic masculinity and like how that can be manipulated to horrible domestic violence ends. Um, and then I wonder, like, what is the framework that can that that it can be reframed as if you gender swap it? Is that valuable? Is that something that we just hmm. that would break us too much? Othello as a black woman is like awesome. Because, yeah. because then I feel like and I hate to be that way, but like I feel like when somebody gender swaps a show that's traditional like that, mm -hmm. you usually do it for a reason. Or that person was the best one who auditioned. Who knows? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I think somebody's doing King Richard right now where I think King Richard is a black woman. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, like, that, that type of nuance where you cast, you say more. So in 2018, in New York, there was a race swapped Othello called Shakespeare in Wakanda. What? <laughs> so it has been done. I think it's I think it's fascinating to me, too. I would love to see that. Shakespeare <laughs> in Wakanda. Interesting. <laughs> you know, the, you know the face from Shrek where they get the picture taken after watching the puppets dance, and they're just like, "The fuck!" <laughs> <laughs> like my whole face. Are we gonna go the whole episode without mentioning the Key and Peel Othello sketch? I don't think I've seen that. <sighs> There's so you gotta so... watch it. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> At this point in the podcast, we went and watched Key and Peele's Othello sketch, and then we talked for a little while about Shaft. Unfortunately, that conversation and that chunk of time was a little bit too long for us to include in the podcast, so we did have to cut it out. But we will now dive back into the post-Key and Peele segment of the podcast. <laughs> Yo, that's hilarious. That's amazing. I've been thinking a lot because I saw uh, Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner a few mm -hmm. months ago. Did, mm -hmm. did you see that, Shaq? No, I haven't. Was it? What was it about? Because I was, was like, uh, I mean, it's about two like black women who one of them is like going through some shit, and so she starts threatening to kill Kylie Jenner on Twitter, and then like her life falls apart. Um, and the whole time she just keeps on tweeting ways that she's gonna kill Kylie Jenner. It's like dark and funny, and they like rap and it's fast. Like they're constantly moving and doing wow. stuff. Like I loved it. It was one of the best things I'd seen in a long time. I was gonna say I think I missed that show. Um, I wanted to see it. I didn't know that's what it was about. Because in the same vein of shows like like Fairview and Slave Play and Way in Ways Othello, you know what I'm saying? Those kind of plays use shock value to mm -hmm. achieve a certain type of result mm -hmm. so i definitely vibe on like why it's like almost like an octoroon bro it's like you mm -hmm. do these shows because they're offensive because they're scary to watch because mm -hmm. it's like you have to face it and right. i think that's the point of like minstrel theater is like you make people face what has actually happened this is what people think about each other this is what people have thought so it's mm -hmm. almost like like when i was a kid right like, I never wanted to fucking watch Brutes, bro. Like, I like why would I want to watch that? You know what I'm saying? But, like, when you grow up black, your parents are like, well, we're going to sit your ass in front of the TV and, like, make your ass watch Roots. And then mm -hmm. you watching that shit like, huh? And they're just like, this is what happened to us. Keep that in your mind. Keep that in your mind and keep that in, like, you know, not to be like, that's the lesson, like, hate white people. That's not what I'm saying. But it's like growing up black and understanding what that means is something that you learn at a very young age. So like a show like Othello, it's almost like it's reaffirming already what black people know, mm -hmm. mm. you know? And yes, and jogged my memory back to why I brought up Kylie Jenner. There is a through line in the story of that thread of the show where she's talking about this and I can't remember her name. She was a performer, essentially a, like a sideshow character that would go around Europe in like the 1700s who's like a African woman with like very large very like voluptuous body to the extent that she was treated like a sideshow character mm -hmm. um and and for her entire life she was treated that way and then comparing it to like Kylie Jenner in the modern era mm -hmm. aspiring to be that kind of thing 
or like making herself look that way and making millions and millions and millions of dollars for it. The idea that like that is it, it's only useful if it has had the edges sh- shaved off and is something that is palpable by white people. Um, then it's something that we can laud and give money to and support. Um, so I wonder with like Othello, like is the reason it has gotten so popular and has stayed popular with people that aren't thinking about why they're doing Othello is because they're subconsciously like engaging in both the exploitation by art of this idea, this giant idea of like, this is play is black suffering. Um, and we're good people for putting it on. Mm-hmm. Is that something that we just need to be louder about constantly with Othello and a ton of other stuff like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's also a world where it's like, you know, they want us selling cocaine and music. They want us like as villains. They want mm-hmm. us as like these tragic characters because the story of the black man is so tragic. But it's like, and it's the last time I'm bring up Shaft, but the fact that he wins in the end of mm-hmm. Shaft is the thing that you don't ever see. It's always a tragic ass mm-hmm. black lead. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? And I'm not saying that like tragedy isn't like at least like speaking as a playwright, I don't use trauma as a means of teaching. I mm-hmm. use reflecting on trauma as the means mm-hmm. of writing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it's like I could only imagine watching that show and getting the 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 message of like simultaneously demonizing being thick while also being like, fuck you, Kylie Jenner, because this is like you are perpetuating this image that you are paying for that mm-hmm. you're not even born with. So I understand like what the show discusses and I, and I, I, I sorry, I, we no, it's care. all good. <laughs> um, and just a follow up thought and I don't have uh, the right answer for us. I'm just curious. Do you think that Denzel should have won an Oscar for training day over any of his other roles that he could have won an Oscar for? Yo, there's a line in Jada Kiss's Why where he's like, why did Denzel have to be crooked before we took it? And it was like, that's how it is. That's how yeah. it is. They want us to see, like, you, that's that's why. You know what I'm saying? That's mm-hmm. why. Denzel Washington has yeah. made so many movies and his only Oscars, I believe, for acting are for glory and training day. Huh. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, Those are great movies, though. They're both great well movies. Deserved. But well it, it makes me think, you know, why does this relate to Othello? Just thinking in the context of, like, his role that he was the most lauded for as this Black actor who has played many roles of a variety of, like, honorable, dishonorable, all over the place. The one that he got the Oscar for is the one where he is a charismatic leader, crooked cop who gets killed at the end hmm. uh, by other Black people, not by the white guy. Don't worry. Yeah, uh, right. Um, Don't worry. It's not us. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> it wasn't us this time. Um, See? Yeah. Putting Othello in that context to me, I wonder, like, going back to the value, like, I love flip-flopping on this with Shaq, is like, I truly had came in with, like, no stake in what my opinion was, and I continue to not know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, this idea that, like, yeah, is it when we perform it and when we put Othello right now, are we ever doing it for the right reasons? because of what it is at this point it's like it's a franchise it's a it's a Uh, brand it's a brand that at this point like all of shakespeare's work are brands mm -hmm. at this point romeo and juliet is a brand and othello is a brand and if someone if oregon shakespeare or anyone puts it up they know they're talking about how it'll put butts in seats they're they're coming at it or they might be coming at it most likely from a we will make money on it first so we should try and make it as sensitive as possible. Mm. Let's make sure that we hire at least three black people for this show. Versus That's like still not enough though. I, oh, no. I know. I'm no. being I'm I'm not, not saying enough. this is the good way to do it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. Versus like honestly, and I say this, Shaq, if you and I were to sit down and, and put together a production of Othello, my suggestion would be that like, hey. When we're talking about the show, when we're building it, we're always viewing it through a lens of race. And every decision that gets made, every rehearsal room, every space, the theater space, is built through the lens of how this show is about race. 
that's the only way you can really use that brand, I think, in a justifiable way right now. Mm. I was just going to say, it's almost like you have to, you have to break the brand a little bit, like, yeah. and, and that's exactly what I'm interested in seeing on stage. If I'm going to see Shakespeare on stage, like, mm -hmm. I don't want to see your cookie cutter production. I want to see you break yeah. what I think I'm going to see. I do not need to like keep a pedestal up for anything that is from over no. 400 years as like no. untouchable, unassailable, art capital a don't how dare you how no. dare you take this and and reappropriate it and mutate it and turn it into something yeah. different the fuck with it all you want yeah. that's what i want to see mm -hmm. there's um, also a world where this is like a shakespeare company and it's like because we're a shakespearean company well we did we did all the other ones guess mm -hmm. we gotta do a fellow mm -hmm. yeah and, and they're it's dreading like, it <laughs> it's, they, it's yeah, like, the bottom it's like of the we list. put this off we put it off <laughs> we have been talking for quite a while um yeah. navi do you want to throw in some info on sri lankan moors before we end i think i i mean i i hit it i hit it pretty much earlier when i like the idea of moors just being this broader thing that was applied to a lot of people mm. um that was just part of that that landscape at the time and like in that sense that like Sri Lankan Moors are like many other places, they're like North African traders who settled in Sri Lanka hmm. um, or darker skinned Sri Lankans because the British were and the Portuguese were all up in there at that time frame and like language and words travel hmm. to the point of Othello being that like Othello is one of the earliest plays I remember reading that has stuck with me for a very long time. I'm not the hugest I don't read Shakespeare or see Shakespeare all the time, but like I have read, I have an English degree. I have read a lot of Shakespeare. I've seen a lot of Shakespeare and Othello still sticks with me as far as like remembering what happened and who the characters were. Othello is something that like, I did not need like to deep dive in order to get back into having a, con be able to have a conversation mm -hmm. about it. Like mm -hmm. it, it at, at its core, it's something that I could relate to as a darker skinned person when I was younger in school, because I remember reading this in school, um, especially because I remember our teacher, Mr. Gaussman, saying the beast with two backs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll stick with you in high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that it's I, I only bring this up because like to me, when I was younger, Othello is a character who like in the media I consumed was one of the few instances where the protagonist or the main person you're following is a person of color and not a white person. Mm. Mm. You know, I grew up in the eighties and the nineties where like TV shows, you have like the black show and then you have a ton of shows where like white is the default mm. um, or, you know, movies and stuff like that, where if you grow up in that landscape, you just see a lot of people who aren't like you portrayed as the main characters so every time mm. now i think I, I think we're getting to a better place with it now but in the 80s and the 90s and like prior and there was a sense you know that like it is a othello situation where there's like one or two black shows or one or two black people on a show like don't get me started on things like friends or like how i met your mother mm -hmm, and stuff like that mm -hmm. like notoriously white friends is that was a tangent. All that to say that, like, yeah, Othello. When I when I read the word more, it it wasn't something that I saw as like, oh, that's speaking to someone that's not me. Hmm. 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 That's so interesting. I see like both the the beauty and the tragedy in that. Uh, before we wrap up, do the two of you have any like finishing thoughts? I like. So how let's question... talk about this Mackay Pfeiffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go for it, what I, no, what I was going to say was that I like how the initial question was like, do we think it should be done? And like, at least personally, I flip flopped over the entire thought, you know, should it be done? No. Should it be done? Yes. And I just think it's just whenever I think theater is difficult, I think you got to do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like whenever it's like difficult, you got to do it. You just got to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. 
I agree. I think it is one thing to do things in ignorance. It is another thing to know yeah. that there are better ways to do things and choose not to do those things anyways. And everyone could use to add a little more self-reflection into why they are making decisions about what they want to produce and put as art. Everyone like never, never feel like you are unquestionable in the choices that you're making, because that's intersectionality is, is being able to like step back and, and view things through that lens. And I think that you can still make dangerous art. I think that you can still make confrontative art. I think you can still make things that like force people to feel uncomfortable and force them to feel whatever emotion you want them to feel. There's correct ways that you could, there's right ways to do that in 2023. But most people would rather just like do the thing and not think about how to change the process. So you can do it. Yeah, anyone can anyone can do it. Can you do it in a way that's appropriate for 2023? Probably not without a ton of care and support and questioning at every step of the way. I think that is an excellent note to wrap up on. Thank you both so much for coming on the podcast. I was thrilled that both of you were interested in coming and talking. Before we say our goodbyes, I think this episode is going to drop the first week of May. Do either of you have any like projects you want to plug? Yeah, I can plug something. Yeah, do um, it. So... Yeah, I got plugs. I got plugs. Uh, you can find my music online at your local Navi on most things. Y-O-U-R-L-O-C-A-L-N-A-V-I. I'm also the artistic lead of a performing arts company, and we have a, a podcast series that is a narrative fiction audio drama podcast series. So we do fully formed plays with music and all of that. Um, we have a cyber noir seven episode show coming in june so if you're listening to this in may it's coming out next month um it's show run by madeline regina uh who is a name some of you might know and it, it is a very fascinating story about capitalism and technology in a not too distant future so yeah check that out you can find me on your local navi on everything else sweet shack um, yo i can't wait for that i know madeline that's awesome um yeah, so uh, you can check me out on Spotify at Shaquille Jamal. You can also uh, Google Candid Yams and Shaquille for the uh, album and stuff like that. Uh, on Instagram, I am Shaquille Jamal. I I wrote a play, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, it's getting produced uh, by Sisters Freehold. We're going up at the Baltimore Theater Project. When's um, that happening? July 14th through the 16th. Yeah, or so 14th, if you're listening sorry, now, you can still get tickets. Yeah, July 14th through the 30th. Let me get them dates right. 14th through the 30th. Sisters Freehold. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a show about code switching and what that means to mm -hmm. different people. I wrote this kind of like a instructional video to using your code switch as a Ooh. black person, which I think that kind of like, that's why the subject matter of Othello, I'm just like, oh, we have to talk about it, but we can't talk about it. We have to talk about it, you know. Everything is a switch. So come mm -hmm. on down, get your tickets. Uh -huh. Awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. The art that both of these people create is always phenomenal. So definitely show your support. Thank you again Thank you. for both of you coming on the show. I have enjoyed this conversation so much. I'm so excited to listen back to it again and take it all in. Um, At what point in the show are we eating cereal? <laughs> are we supposed to do that at the beginning or do we do you that know, now you know it's funny <laughs> in the first before we were like a podcast podcast uh and we were just a youtube show if people were coming and drinking instead of smoking i had like a literal bowl that i made them drink their uh alcohol out uh, of so that was fun <laughs> all right y'all what do you have coming up what's what uh what episodes after this oh me after this we are going to have an episode about 12th night i would say the names of our guests but i actually don't know how to say the last names of either of those people i'm going to ask them tomorrow before we record the episode um but we're gonna have a lot of uh cool conversations regarding um how 12th night changes when you view viola through the lens of a trans mask or trans femme person and 
dive a little bit into how Twelfth Night isn't technically a problem play, but like it's a melancholic tragedy, so it it really fits right in there. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that'll be our episode next week. I hope y'all will tune in. Until then, we will see y'all later. Bye, all. If you enjoyed today's episode, you can follow Shaq, Navi, and Bulls with the Bard at the handles either on your screen or in the description. And tune in next week as we talk with Elise Sharp and Courtney Smith of the Shakespeare Anyone podcast about Taming of the Shrew as a problem play. Until then, bye, all. A thousand, thousand sighs to save, oh, lay me where sad true lover, never find my grave to weep there.